So I follow my uh, follow my lecture note that I um, uh, I update regularly. Probably they won't change much. Hi. Uh, so you are a uh, Mehmet. Um, uh, yes, I probably they won't change much because I've already revised them once. Uh, but I might make a small changes. The uh, the path that I follow is uh, is a bit different from uh, usual textbooks on GR. I follow a path which is uh, more uh, uh, something that is closer uh, to what or the way particle physicists think about GR. So I, uh, I start from uh, representation theory of Poincaré symmetry. I talk about uh, field theory and various fields or uh, various particles that we can have, then, uh, uh, then uh, which is uh, which is the description that we learn uh, to use when we combine quantum mechanics with uh, with the special relativity. So we know that we have to talk about uh, quantum theory of fields, and then. Uh, then in this context, we ask what would be the theory that describes gravity, some relativistic theory that would uh, would uh, replace Newtonian gravity, which is non-relativistic. So we have a relativistic quantum field theory machinery. We want to learn how to incorporate uh, incorporate. Uh, also the laws of gravity into that. So we try to generalize Newtonian gravity into, uh, into a relativistic theory. Uh, so I, I try to do this at the linearized level where uh, gravity is weak and then we start from the simplest scenario. We see that the simplest scenario which is having a scalar gravity fails. Then we go this we go to the second to the simplest scenario, which is having a spin two gravity, and uh, that uh, that uh, does very well. It is in agreement with whatever we already seen, and we uh, we then go to the nonlinear level and construct GI and there are Einstein equations, and then the my part finishes. Um, okay, so today. Uh, Basically, the first few lectures are going to be mostly review. Uh, probably you have seen these things before, maybe in a slightly different ways. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of review of Poincaré symmetry and special relativity. Um, and like vector notation or tensor notation. Tomorrow, I'll talk about uh, a little bit about uh, dynamics and acceleration. Then I think we will talk about the electromagnetism and nodal theorem and so on. And then we'll continue. All right, so today we are going to talk about Uh, okay, so how do we start? The, uh, there is, uh, it's very simple, I think. So the, by now you have learned uh, so much mathematics and you know, have seen this uh, stuff so many times that probably uh, it's either you already know everything that I'm uh, saying right now Oh, by the way, you should feel free to leave or not to come to the lecture if, if you don't learn something. Are, at, at the end of the day, the, if, you are, if you can do the exercises, the homework, and do the exam, that's, that's totally fine. For me, it doesn't matter if you come to the lecture. Uh, okay, so yeah, by either you all know everything, or if, if 
if you don't, you can learn it in uh, very quick. Uh, okay, so it's all about uh, talking about geometry. Uh, so maybe we can first go back to to the Euclidean space or oh, Euclidean plane. Yes. Uh, so we can see the Euclidean plane x y, and then we can consider two points in this Euclidean plane a and b. And we have a notion of the, the path with the shortest length with this, between these two points. And that, we, that is something that we call, the, we call the Euclidean distance. So there is I A B, uh, which is the square of the Euclidean distance between these two points on this plane. And what is that? It is R A minus R B the square, uh, which is x a minus x b squared plus y a minus y b squared. Okay, so now, so there is this Euclidean distance between these two points. Now, we, here I chose a, a, a coordinate system, uh, this x y system, to calculate this distance between the two points. Uh, now we can ask, uh, what kind of transformations of this uh, coordinate system or this plane we can do uh, under which this distance remains the same. So this is invariant under uh, this transformation. So what are those? And those we call the symmetries of this Euclidean plane. The symmetries of Euclidean plane are the transformations that keep this distance invariant. Uh, okay, so what are those transformations? Uh, one is that if I move everything by a constant, by a constant vector, and that's the constant translation. Um, translation. So we say R goes to R prime, which is R plus a constant vector. Uh, clearly, that doesn't affect this Euclidean distance because it uh, vanishes in the subtraction. The second uh, transformation, which is a bit non trivial, is if I rotate this plane. And how does it work? It, uh, it is x prime equals uh, x times cosine theta plus y sine theta and y prime is equal to y times cosine theta minus x times sine theta. So under this transformation also this combination remains invariant. It's, it remains invariant in a slightly more non-trivial way compared to the original. Uh, okay, so and these are the only symmetries that we have for the Euclidean plane. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to, so this is a simple example. At the end of the day, these Poincaré symmetries in a special relativity are basically generalizations of these two. So there is nothing much more uh, complicated about them. Maybe some signs change because of because time is a slightly different from this. Yes. Does locality keep keep it invariant also here? Yeah. Oh yes, thank you. Yes, there is also parity. Uh, I am. Um, uh, I'm considering, I'm considering, uh, what are they call it? Uh, I'm considering transformations which can be connected, uh, which are continu can be continuously connected to a trivial transformation. Uh, so parity is not one of those because I cannot continuously con 
connect parity to achieve your transformation, but yes, they are, uh, parity is also another one. Uh, so, yeah, let's just focus on those, but parity is definitely there too. Uh, and also in Poincaré, we I'll focus on the on this subgroup that is continuously connected to the unit. Uh, okay, so then it's very convenient to uh, use some matrix notation. Uh, which is I, uh, but this R vector I put it uh, is basically made, it's a vector made of X and Y, and I, uh, I denote them by putting an index on R. So I will call them as RI, and here I is either 1 or 2, and R1 is X, R2 is Y. Uh, now, what is this invariant distance in terms of in this matrix notation? In the matrix notation, if I want to write the invariant distance, I can write it in the following way: a i a b is equal to sum over i and uh, j going from one to two delta i j. And let me call R A B R A minus R B. So R A B is R A minus R B I R A B J. And then in the um, in the following in the future after this formula, I will never write this. Uh, or almost never write this summation uh, sigma here. So the, we use the summation convention. Every re repeated index, index has been is summed over. So this is just the cause of that. And this delta ij is uh, is the Kronecker delta. So delta ij is a matrix with one in the diagonals. Here there is only two, uh, two rows and columns. So this is the time. Now in this matrix notation, I can write the rotation uh, also in terms of the uh, matrix multiplication. So I have R prime I is equal to a uh, rotation matrix R i j times R j, where this rotation matrix is so this R i j is a rotation matrix, or the R uh, is a rotation matrix, and R i j are its components, which is cosine theta, sine theta minus sine theta, cosine theta. Uh, and then, uh, what is the general property of this rotation matrices? What they do is that they preserve this inner product invariant. So if I plug this uh, expression here and require that it is invariant for all uh, R A B is what I will learn is that delta M N R M I R N J is equal to delta I J. So this is the this is the defining property of rotation. These are matrices that uh, preserve uh, preserve the Euclidean inner product. And uh, rotations form a group. So we have rotation group. So 
So what is the definition of a group? Groups are uh, defined based on three properties. Uh, groups are sets, a uh, collection of elements. And this set should have three properties to be a group. There has to be a composition law or a product, a multiplication. So, uh, uh, so what do we say? We have a general group G and the first property that we have is that if A and B are in G, then there is a composition law AB uh, that takes, produces new elements of the group. So A times B is also a, an element of the group. The second property is that they have a unit element with the property that 1 times A is equal to A times 1 equal to A. They have unity. And then the last property is that every element has an, has an inverse. So I, for every A, there, uh, there exists A minus such that A times A minus is equal to A minus times A is equal to 1. Uh, what are the examples? The examples are, uh, for instance, the integers where the composition law is the summation. So if I take G to be the set of integer numbers, then here the composition law will be just the summation, A plus B. So let's call them n. n plus m is a, uh, uh, belongs to integers. The unit element is zero. Finally, the, the inverse is just minus n. Okay, so uh, now rotations, uh, well, this is just a group, not rotation. Uh, this is a group, but rotations are also also form a group. So now here I can I rotate, and the uh, so what are the what is the composition of rotations is uh, essentially matrix multiplications. So if I take R one and R two two rotation matrices, then uh, the composition law that I have is uh, essentially a contracting the, the matrices, or doing a ma contracting the indices, or doing a matrix multiplication. So the, uh, there will be R1 dot R2 Uh, whose components i and j are given by r1 i k r2 k j so usual uh, matrix uh, multiplication uh, what is uh, what is the unity? The unity is just a unit matrix. So one i j is just the Kronecker delta. So it's one if the i and j are the same, and zero if i and j are different. Uh, 
and there is a there is an inverse rotation. Uh, so, for instance, if I consider the rotations in uh, in the two D plane, then R theta, the rotations are just characterized by a single angle theta angle of rotation, and the inverse of this is nothing but r r minus state. Uh, what else? Uh, there is a difference between the group of rotations and integers. And the difference is that the group of rotations is, uh, is called a continuous group. Uh, what does it mean? It means that its elements are parameterized by a, by a continuous variable, theta. So theta belongs to uh, real numbers. It can be continuously, uh, the, we can, if we consider the unit element of the rotation group, we can continuously move away from that unit element. That's what I was saying before. Uh, now these continuous groups are characterized by the dimension, by the number of ways you can move away from the unit element, which is the trivial rotation. Now for instance, in two dimensions, what is the dimension of the rotation group? One, because we can only have one way of rotating. In 3D, we have three independent rotations uh, along in the XY plane, XZ plane, and YZ plane. And then in D dimensions, we can, uh, we can easily calculate what is the number of what is the number of independent uh, independent elements or independent uh, sorry not the independent elements so the number of the dimension of the group the number of independent ways that we can go away from unity so how do we do that uh, we consider rotations which are near the infin uh, infinitesimally close to the trivial rotation which is unity. Uh, so if I want to put indices, what this means is that Rij is delta Ij plus some epsilon Ij, where epsilons, all, uh, um, all components of epsilon are much smaller than one in absolute value. Then we consider this defining property of the rotation group. So if I plug this in there and I keep only to linear order to epsilon, what it tells me is that epsilon, uh, so what does it tell me? It tells me that delta ik epsilon kj plus delta jk epsilon ki is equal to zero. Or if I define epsilon with lower indices, so if I just call this epsilon ij with lower indices, then this tells me that this epsilon ij is an anti-symmetric matrix. Note that since this delta is uh, just a unit matrix, if I want to put this components of epsilon into a to, into a matrix, because it's a rank, rank two uh, object, it has two indices. So I can put it inside a square matrix. 
uh, the components of this FCIJ with lower indices and FCIJ with upper indices, they would be identical because the difference between them is just the multiplication by this Kronecker delta, which is just a unit, unit matrix. So I, I have this condition. Now, what do we want to ask? We want to ask how, what, what are the number of ways that you can go away from the unit, uh, unit uh, element from trivial rotations? So, basically the question is, uh, what are the number of independent uh, ways that we can have this epsilon? And uh, the number of in independent components of this epsilon uh, which satisfy this uh, criterion in D dimensions can be uh, can be calculated in the following way. So this epsilon ij is just a, an anti-symmetric matrix. Uh, every for every pair of i and j which are uh, different from each other, that has an that would be an independent component of this matrix. So the number of independent uh, uh, independent components of this epsilon is just choosing uh, two uh, from D where D is the number of dimensions so, so far we were talking about uh, Euclidean plane in which D would be two but in general in D dimensions for any two different different dimensions, we have one independent element, so this gives us d times d minus 1 divided by 2. So for instance, we can check that if uh, d is equal to 2, no, let's put it here, I get 1, if d is equal to 2, and I get 3, then d is equal to 3. So it agrees with what we expect. Any questions so far? So if we get this formula from uh, counting just anti-symmetry anti -symmetry matrix, how, how the free parameters in, in just the normal anti-symmetric matrix? Yes, yes. So this epsilon is an anti-symmetric matrix and what we are asking is that what are, how many independent components this epsilon matrix has. And the only condition on it is anti-symmetry, so that would be the number of independent components of such a matrix, such a d by d matrix. So remember, if we are in d dimensions, this i and j go from 1 to d. So why are we interested in symmetries of Euclidean space? Uh, the reason is, even though in our universe we have preferred positions and we have preferred directions, uh, for instance, the direction that the, the direction between me and you, that's the preferred direction. Uh, we believe that these are not the uh, these are not preferred directions or position in the fundamental description of nature. So we expect that laws of physics should not have any depend any preferred direction or position. Therefore, laws of physics have to be in invariant under the symmetries of the Euclidean space. And indeed, 
if we look for instance at classical mechanics, the laws of classical mechanics are invariant on the symmetries of the Euclidean space. Uh, however, they, if we look at the laws of classical mechanics, they are they have a preferred time. They don't have any preferred position or direction, but they, there is a preferred time. So every, all good uh, clocks are supposed to measure that universal time, or uh, maybe not that time, but the time differences that the, all different clocks are measuring, they have to agree with each other. On the other hand, if you look at electromagnetism, uh, electromagnetism, if, uh, if it was supposed to be the theory that is seen by all different observers or moving clocks, that would imply that different clocks have to measure different times if they are moving with respect to each other. So there is some uh, some tension between classical mechanics and electromagnetism. And special relativity is the, is the theory that uh, takes electromagnetism as the more fundamental and takes classical mechanics as being an approximation. So then we go to a special relativity in which time and space are uh, time and space are treated on a more equal footing. So one considers the following invariant interval, which is minus c squared ta minus tb squared plus ra minus rb squared. Okay, now uh, if, if I consider just equal time uh, points which are at equal time, if Ta minus Tb is equal to zero, then I'm back to the original, original story that we were discussing. We just have the Euclidean distance between the two points. Uh, and, uh, and then the symmetries that preserve this distance will be rotations and translations, spatial rotations and spatial translations. Uh, however, now we can also talk about uh, points in a space-time. So we are not treating time and space on a more equal footing. But now we are talking about points in a space-time, which are called events. And since we are treating them in a more equal footing, it makes sense to now draw diagrams that have T and X on them. And we can put points in a space-time or events and talk about this uh, distance between two of these points. So first of all, if T uh, TAB is equal to zero, we are back to the Euclidean, Euclidean distance. On the other hand, if we take TAB different from zero, but imagine that RAB is zero, so it takes two points, A and B, for which this uh, this object vanishes, right? I A B is equal to zero. So what does it mean? It tells me that I A B divided by T A B 
is equal to zero. Now, if I postulate that this uh, quantity, this interval, is invariant on the transformations, or find transformations that keep this interval invariant, transformations of time and t and r, so remember, I'm just repeating the same thing that we did before. We had, before, we had the Euclidean distance, which was just this part. And I asked what are the transformations that keep this distance invariant. Now I'm putting time and space inside one formula, and I'm asking for transformations that keep this whole uh, combination invariant. If I ask for something like that, then by definition in the any in the new in the new coordinates I should have uh, this ratio has to vanish. That's what I require. And what it tells me sorry, why do I say zero? This is uh, C as uh, if I say a A B is equal to zero. Then it tells me R A B divided by P A B is equal to C. If I say R A B is invariant, then it tells me R A B prime divided by P A B prime is equal to C. So what does it mean? It means that there is some, there is an absolute, there is an absolute speed which is c, and that's what electromagnetism uh, tells us. So no matter, uh, uh, as long, whenever electromagnetism holds, the speed of light is fixed. Is equal to c. This frame in the tent, and this is the. And uh, so this is, the, this is the transformations that is postulated to be the fundamental symmetry of uh, laws of physics in a special relativity. And that's what, uh, that's what electromagnetism is invariant on. Uh, all right. Questions? No questions. Okay, so what property, one property that this uh, invariant distance I uh, call it, uh, sometimes I call it a Lorentzian distance. One property that this Lorentzian distance uh, has is that it is sign indefinite. So before, if we looked at the Euclidean distance, uh, it was always a positive. It was positive un unless the two points are identical, in which case it would be zero. Uh, now, uh, this object is not sign definitely. And uh, the transformations that we have, they, uh, so let's, uh, let, let us consider again one of these space-time diagrams. The fact that this is uh, not sign definitely, what it does is that it divides the space-time diagram into into three regions. So first of all, uh, there is a there is an absolute speed which I set to one. So let's set c to one from now on.
And let's imagine one of these two points is at the origin. So at, it's at t equal to 0 and x is x equal to 0. So one of them is sitting here. And then we can ask about the sign of this invariant distance at different points in this space-time diagram. And uh, those, uh, the sign changes. So there is region 1, region 2, and region 3, where uh, in region 1, the sign of the invariant product is positive. In region 2, is 0. And in region 3, it is negative. And the points that are, so if, if I set one of the points and say point A at the origin, if point B is in region 1, we call it time like separated from point A. If it is in region 2, which is uh, uh, in this two dimensional uh, two-dimensional diagram is basically a line. In general, it will be a light cone in higher dimensions. So if you imagine I have some other other spatial dimension that comes out of the out of the blackboard, then this will be some light cone. Uh, so if I th this region two will be a, a lower dimensional hypersurface in this, or surface in this diagram, which corresponds to the null separation at which this interval is zero, and then outside that light cone, we have, this, we have a space-like separation when this, uh, this in, uh, invariant distance is negative. Now, Lorentz Poincaré uh, uh, transformation, transformations that preserve this obviously don't change this causal structure. So there are there are points which are time-like separated, and in all uh, in uh, all uh, now when we do these uh, transformations, we call them different frames. So when we go from t and x to t prime and x prime, we we call it a change of change of frame, going from one frame to another. Uh, in all frames, the, uh, when we do transformation between different frames, then this invariant uh, distances remain uh, in is the same. Then this causal structure remains the same. Now, why is it important? It is important because it tells us that uh, first of all, we have an absolute speed, which is the speed of light. Every every observer or every physical object is uh, moving with a speed which is uh, smaller than the speed of light. And what it means is that the news or signals cannot propagate outside this light. Uh, that's why it's called causality. The, the points which are... The point A, which sits at the center of this diagram, can only influ influence things which are uh, inside its light cone or on the light cone. And it can be influenced by things that are inside uh, also. Well, we can also divide this light cone into two parts, the future and past. So this point A can influence the things in the future light cone and can be influenced by the points in the past light cone. But it cannot influence things which are space like separate. Uh, so this is a this is a very deep consequence of uh, having switching from uh, the symmetries of classical mechanics which are Galilean symmetries into the symmetries of uh, electromagnetism which is uh, Poincaré symmetry. So what are these symmetries? They are transformations of uh, T and R which preserve this distance invariant. So again we want to use some matrix notation. 
So I, I write X mu, uh, which is the collection of P and R, such that X0 is equal to T, and then XR is what I used to call RI. So this mu goes from 0, 1, Uh, and then uh, we can intro introduce the Minkowski metric which is minus one 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 and then in terms of this in a met if I use matrix notation this uh, Lorentz interval becomes x a b mu eta mu nu x a b mu x a b mu where again I'm summing over repeated in the indices now what we want to ask is and this x a b is as usual as before x a b mu is x a mu minus x b mu. Now, we, what we are going to ask is, as in the case of symmetries of the Euclidean plane, we want to ask what are the transformations of this x mu into some x prime mu, so that this i a b remains unchanged. And as before, we want to focus on transformations which are continuously connected to the uh, to trivial transformation. Okay, so one part of it is as before. It's just a trans the just a generalization of translations before we had uh, the space space translations which would cancel from this difference now we can also have time translations so uh, part of it will be translation, the other part will be the generalization of rotations which are called uh, Lorentz transformations so maybe I can write it already here okay. we want to take x prime mu to be lambda mu nu x nu plus a mu. So what is a mu? A mu is a constant translation. Now this is a space-time translation. And this lambda mu nu is the generalization of rotations. So this, these are Lorentz transformation. Uh, which are basically rotations plus uh, boosts. Rotations, we saw what they are. Boosts are, uh, I'm sure you all know what they are. They are generalizations of rotations, except that they rotate time into a space, or a space into time. And for instance, in this two dimension, uh, of one plus one dimensional context is uh, nothing but writing, taking t prime to be 
uh, gamma t uh, minus vx and x prime equals gamma x minus vt if you have other dimensions this is this will be a boost along the x direction and then you will have y prime equal to y and z prime equal to z and here this gamma is related to v as in this way um, it's got the Lorentz factor um, and v is uh, so for this formula to make sense v as v squared has to be less than unity and remember we set the speed of light to speed of light to 1 so the transformations have to be subluminal yes for the distance, are we always going to use uh, eta mu nu as this and put an extra minus sign uh, on the right? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll always use that. But it's a matter of convention. It, it's not, there is nothing very uh, deep about it. But for the rest of this course, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to this convention, yeah. I guess. Uh, okay. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. short question. Would be the first, uh, first, uh, positive negative? Uh, uh, constant the interval in there. The interval here? No. Yeah. yeah. Positive in time. Uh, oh. Uh, you are right. Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yes. Okay, so already here I didn't follow the comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, but I think this is correct. All right. So what do we do next? Um, okay, so I talk a bit about curves and then we and word lines and then we be done. So in Euclidean plane we could uh, we could consider so let's go back again to Euclidean. We could consider a curve or a smooth curve that connects the two points A and B. And uh, the fact that we introduce some Euclidean distance that allows us to also assign a length, a Euclidean length to this curve. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, so we want to talk about uh, uh, L. So let's call this curve C. So we want to talk about L, length of this curve C. How do we assign a length to this curve? Uh, given that we already introduced the Euclidean distance between two, two points, that's easy. We just divide this into uh, very little infinitesimal pieces. So that every piece is a, is a straight line, is the shortest. Uh, shortest uh, curve between the two points and then sum over them and take the limit so when we take the limit that becomes an integral 
where dl from a to b where dl is or dl is squared is delta ij times dri drj and then we choose the positive roots to take the integral so that's how we uh, define uh, calculate the le lengths of a curve in Euclidean plane or in Euclidean space uh, what else we can do we can also assign a tangent vector a unit tangent vector to a curve so this unit tangent vector t is as components t i which are given by d r i d l and then it's a unit vector as you can see because t squared is delta i j t i t j which is equal to equal to 1 because of this definition so this is the tangent vector um, ok so now going back to the to a space time uh, we can talk about curves that are the set of events that uh, uh, an observer or an, a physical object goes through them in its life and that is called word line so we said that the physical any physical observer or object uh, moves at the subluminal speed so if it passes through the origin it will remain inside the light cone maybe it continues even to the past now what we can do is do the same thing ask uh, first of all so this curve how, how can we parameterize it? We can, for instance, parameterize it by, by saying what is x as a function of t. So that, that one way of parameterizing this curve here. Uh, one thing that we can ask is what is the length of this curve between two points, say t1 and t2. and we, ca we calculate this length in exactly the same way what do we do? we divide this into very little pieces and then we say uh, and that length we call it tau in fact because of this sign convention the fact that the time part comes from with the positive sign uh, we call it proper time so this is this tau 1, 2 uh, we call it a Lorentz Lorentzian distance or, or the proper time which is obtained uh, by essentially the same procedure dividing into little pieces and then or t1 to t2 and then integrate over those but this t tau is the length of this infinitesimal the Lorentzian length of this infinitesimal uh, elements so d tau squared is theta squared is minus eta mu nu dx mu dx nu 
Um, so for instance, if we imagine uh, an, an observer that moves at a constant speed, Uh, so then this, this world line becomes just a line, it becomes a straight line, uh, here I have x, t, and then this line is uh, parameterized by x of t equals v t. Uh, then I can write this uh, the tau squared is just uh, it, it just becomes dt squared times 1 minus dx dt squared which is dt squared 1 minus v squared dt squared gamma uh, dt squared will gamma square, where gamma is the same gamma that I introduced the defined terms of this velocity v. Of course this is correct even if, if, even if the velocity changes with time. At any moment we have some instantaneous velocity and that will be the relation between dt and theta. So, uh, in fact, I can actually erase this because it's, I don't need to make that assumption. So, what does this tell me? It tells me that dt theta is equal to gamma of v, the ins instantaneous speed. And then here I can, as before, as here, I can define a tangent to the load line. A unit tangent. And that unit tangent is called uh, the four velocity. So what is for velocity is defined the same way that I defined the unit tangent in Euclidean plane. Uh, is dx mu by d tau. Uh, now if we are in two dimension, the four velocity is the two uh, is a two dimensional vector. So it's maybe it's actually kind of two velocity. Four is just a number of dimensions. Uh, so okay. So what is what is this? This is dt d tau, and here I have d uh, dx d tau. And I, I can factor out dt by d tau, so this becomes 1 dx dt. And dt by d tau is nothing but gamma. And dx by dt is just velocity. Now we can see that this for velocity uh, as expected, it is unit, which means that if I take the, if I calculate the Lorentzian length of this four velocity, so what I can call u squared, which is eta mu nu, u mu, u nu.
that is going to be no, it is going to be minus one because we had a minus in our Or if you like, you can put a minus. I don't know, this is just to be finished. So, okay, so this is, uh, this is the tangent to the word line. Uh, now, yes. Yeah, you said that we can generalize it again. But we try the velocity is standing with velocity, so that we will have an acceleration. Sorry, say it again. There you said that we can generalize it to um, the time dependent velocity. Time dependent velocity. So yes. That we will have uh, an acceleration. Right, yes. So, doesn't that case we still have um, uh, between different observers the same invariant? Um, or, um, so, oh, actually, I cannot like um, connect how ca how we uh, we use uh, acceleration mm -hmm. um, in transformation, which is just contain velocity. Oh, okay, okay. Acceleration. I guess I understand your question. So. Uh, one thing we talked about was to imagine to consider transformations that preserve this Lorentzian distance, right? And those transformations were Poincaré transformations. So there was the usual translation, and then there were Lorentz transformations which contain a boost. And the boost is parameterized by velocity, which is a constant velocity. So, uh, and there are different Lorentz frames or inertial frames that uh, preserve this, this Lorentzian distance and, and those are parameterized by their constant velocity. On the other hand, you can imagine an observer or some object, a particle, something that can move with a time-dependent velocity. Right? That's what everyone does. All the time, right? We, uh, we all the with the acceleration, uh, and now what I'm doing is I fix my frame. So there is this. This is my Lorentz frame that I'm talking about. I'm considering the trajectory of one uh, one object which has acceleration. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that that uh, that object that is that. Uh, corresponds to a curve in this uh, space-time which is called word line and then I'm talking about the tangent to that curve now if you want to imagine uh, Lorentz transformations then there is a concept called the instantaneous rest frame so you can imagine a frame that is instantaneously at rest with respect to your accelerating observer. But at different times, there will be different frames which are at rest with respect to your observer. So there is, there is no single frame that is, uh, that in which this observer is at rest. In other words, this, this observer does not correspond to an inertial observer, does not correspond to a single frame, inertial frame for which the... Yeah, there are different... If you have acceleration, then there will be different frames which are uh, instantaneously at rest with respect to you. Other okay, now we can let's just solve a little problem and then go. 
uh, which is to calculate the relative velocity. So if now we imagine that we have two if we imagine we have two observers with who are moving with constant velocity. Say so this one is x equals V B T and this is x equals dat um, so what we can ask the following question what would be the velocity so these are two observers at constant velocity uh, now it, uh, it is uh, uh, therefore, there are inertial observers, meaning that there is a frame, there is a Lorentz frame which is at rest with respect to A, and there is another Lorentz frame which is at rest with respect to B. Now, what we can ask is that uh, what is the velocity of this observer B in the rest frame of observer A, or Maybe a simpler way of saying that is that what is the relative velocity of the two? What is the v velocity of b as measured by a? So we can ask what is this? So how do we calculate that? There, there is an easy way, of course, to calculate it. Uh, the easy way is to just uh, look at our formula for the, for the boost. So we imagine doing a Lorentz transformation from this frame to the frame in which the uh, observer A is at rest. So what are those transformations? Is uh, T prime is equal to gamma A, T minus a x and x prime is and let me actually write infinitesimal ones because we really only care about the changes and not the absolute values so that means that even if this they not they did not meet at the center that wouldn't change the question of relative velocity Okay, so this, for a given interval, time interval and a space interval in this frame, you have new time intervals in the frame which is at rest with respect to A. Yes? Uh, we could write this directly like this because they are both inertial uh, and has the, have the constant speeds yeah, yeah. on each one, like as we discussed previously. Mm -hmm. uh, if it depends on V, yeah. gamma, then yeah. it could be more complicated. Yes, yes, that's true. In that case, it, it wouldn't, we could only ask about, for instance, as we could ask about the relative velocity at this given moment when they pass close to each other. So for instance, if they had some acceleration, then you could still ask like, what is the relative velocity when they, are, when they are passing by each other and then there would be some uh, uh, instantaneous rest frame of one of them. So the question would be what is the velocity of B in the instantaneous rest frame of A when A and B are passing by each other. This would be a very defined question to ask. Does it only make sense when they pass by at the uh, same space point, or does it also make sense when they are separate? 
Um, no, you can also ask when they are separate, as long as you can formulate it in, a, in an unambiguous way. So I could ask it for, as long as I can point out to some, some specific event uh, unambiguously, then you can ask it. If I give the four coordinates of yeah. the point, then it's unambiguous, but yeah. distances might change. Yeah. Um, other questions? No. Okay, now we can imagine uh, the two points that are separated by uh, two points on the on the world line uh, of server B so then we have dx over dt equals vb so we can focus on that and essentially the question is that what is dx prime divided by dt prime of observer B. This is uh, this is what we mean by VBA. Oh, let's, I can even put some in this some uh, subscripts here. So what is that? I just divide these two equations. And what I get is VB minus, sorry, this is VB minus VA divided by 1 minus VA VB. Now, this is the easy way to, I mean, there are always, all of the ways are easy, but this is what's the read line. Uh, you can do a little bit of more algebra uh, to see the usefulness of using uh, matrix notation. So we define this four velocity. Four velocity is a four vector, very similar to the tangent vector that we define in Euclidean play on the uh, rotations, the components of vector change. Similarly, the components of the four, ve four, four velocity will change on the Lorentz transformation. Uh, so the components of this are not invariant. However, if we contract the components you know, and obtain scalar quantities, those will be invariant. So if we can uh, write the relative velocity in terms of an invariant quantity, then we can calculate it in any frame that we want. So there will be an alternative way of doing that, which is to consider the four velocity of observer B and the four velocity of observer A. Now, if I go to the frame, this B, this T prime x prime frame, then observer A will be at rest in this frame. When it when someone is at rest, its four velocity will be just one zero, and gamma factor is also one uh, because gamma is just one over the square root of one minus v square. So u prime mu of A is uh, just one zero and u prime mu of b is gamma of what we call vba the velocity of b in the rest frame of a times 1 vba right? so in the frame in which a is at rest the velocity of b is called VBA and this is the formula for the four velocity in terms of the three velocity. Now if I look at the 
if I look at the invariant quantity, which is the inner product of U A prime and U B prime, that is just minus gamma of V A B, which is minus one divided by the square root of one minus V B A square. But this product is invariant under Lorentz transformation. So I can as well calculate it in the original frame. So this has to be equal to eta mu nu u a mu u b nu. And now we have all of the information to calculate this product in the original frame. Uh, because we know the four velocities in the original the three velocities and therefore the four velocities in the new frame. So what are they? The U A is gamma A times one B A and U B is gamma B one B B. So if we calculate this uh, inner product, we get minus gamma A, gamma B, um, times 1 minus V A times V B. Or to be more explicit, we get minus 1 minus V A times V B divided by the square root of one minus V A square times one minus V B square. And then we are almost done because what we want is to calculate V B A square uh, in terms of V A and V B. So uh, I leave it as an exercise to square this equation and invert it to recover that. Now whenever we solve, uh, we derive some results, uh, we should always make sure that it makes sense. But let's say this makes sense. Uh, what, how do we check that this makes sense? For instance, we imagine the case in which VA uh, observe A Alice is at rest. When Alice is at rest, then the velocity of Bob in the Alice's frame is just the original velocity because Alice's frame is basically the original frame that we started with. So when uh, when V A is equal to zero, we have to recover VBA equals VB, which is the case. What other check can we do? We can, for instance, send VA to 1 plus or minus 1. Uh, say we send it to 1. So what does it mean? It means that Alice is moving with the speed of light. And then what happens to this formula if I send VA to 1? Since everything has to, since the speed of light is the absolute speed, then the relative velocity of B and A has to also be equal to the speed of light. And that's indeed what's happening here. If I send VA to 1, then uh, what do I get? I get V B A is equal to minus one. So if V A is moving at the speed of light, V B is going in that in, in Alice's frame. Bob is moving with the speed of light in the opposite direction. Uh, yeah, I guess I don't have any other sanity check for this form. Uh, and nothing else for today. Okay. Are there any are there any questions?